Okay, well, good morning, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers of the conference for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and Stephanie, it was a great talk. It was uh, taking a really complicated topic in which we're all sort of operating in the dark and sort of making it manifest. And the number of people that come into clinic wanting to discuss estrogen and low T are, are huge. Um, my, I was, um, I'm giving a talk today on peripartum cardiomyopathy, and um, the first part of it is going to be fairly standard, and then I'm going to deviate a little bit into some interesting immunology and some speculative data that should just be a little bit of an appetizer, again, um, for things to come. Um, first of all, I need to tell you that maternal mortality in the United States is actually rising substantially. And this is a very frightening statistic. In many, many countries, the maternal mortality has decreased. But the United States, unfortunately, is a glaring exception. And I, I know that you know there's a mantra in the United States, we have the best healthcare system in the world, we have the best healthcare system in the world. But if you think about maternal mortality as an important reflection of that, we are really not doing so well. A recent report by McDormand et al. found a baseline mortality rate of 18.8 .8 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in 214. If we contrast this data to Germany or the United Kingdom, they are both reporting 6.7 um, maternal deaths per the same 100,000 live births. And, and I think it's also really important to underscore the fact that African American women have a maternal mortality rate that is double that of Caucasian counterparts. And this was actually detailed even as early as 2007 by a Texas legislative report. To put that graphically, this is a fairly, uh, this is comparing maternal mortality rates between 1990 and 2013 in a number of different countries. And as you see, we are not really doing so well. Our maternal mortality is sharply rising. We are doing far worse than New Zealand, Canada, Netherlands, Australia, Denmark, Singapore, Norway, and Switzerland. Now, if we delve into this a little bit further and we say, what's going on? It's still not entirely clear, but um, we seem to be doing a little bit better in hemorrhages, um, obstructive labor a little bit more, sepsis a little better, hypertension about the same. Um, and then we have these sort of um, murky categories of indirect, late, and other direct which are not, which seem to be sort of a grab bag of other causes that are contributing to this. So I think first of all we need to put this peripartum cardiomyopathy uh, data into this context that we are not doing a good job for our, our mothers and for the children of these mothers at the moment. And I think that this is almost, I mean this, this needs to be a real call to action. So let me talk to you a little bit about peripartum cardiomyopathy because this is a, um, a very interesting and very tragic disease. I mean, uh, this is, um, I saw my first case of peripartum cardiomyopathy when I was at UCSF uh, working with Norma, Nora Goldschlager and we were taking care of a young African American woman who developed this terrible heart failure shortly after having her first baby. Unfortunately, after, um, she did die of this disorder, leaving an orphan child. And so this is the kind of illness that when you lose a young mother, it has echoes in the family um, and in the child's life forever. And so it really is a multiplicative tragedy. We have a recently revised definition, and that is, this is an idiopathic cardiomyopathy presenting with heart failure that becomes manifest towards the end of the pregnancy and in the, and in the months following delivery. 
where no other cause of heart failure is identified. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And when you see these people, um, we have to take a careful family history and we have to think, is there a family history of cardiomyopathy in the family? Did the stress of the pregnancy seem to unmask that cardiomyopathy? Is there lupus? Are there other causes? Was the mother hypertensive? And so you really have to go down the laundry list and, you know, are they, have they been diabetic for 10 years? What? And so, but, but, so this is really a diagnosis that is reserved for people who get very, very sick out of the blue in the pregnancy with no recognized risk factors. So what is the incidence? And in fact, the incidence varies very widely. So there seems to be a genetic predisposition for this. It may be other things as well. One in 100 live births in Africa, women experience, uh, are, are diagnosed with car, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. One in 100 live births also in Haiti. One in 3,000 live births in the United States. And one in 6,000 live births in Japan. And recently, an increase in the incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy has been recorded in the United States. Now we're thinking it's closer to 8.5 to 11.5 for 10,000 live births. So why is this? And we don't know. All this data is pretty hand wavy and speculative. We think that you know people say it's due to the increase in um, maternal age. It's increased. It's I'm sorry, maternal age as opposed to just yeah gestational age. Increased multi-fetal pregnancy incidence because we're having we're using more uh, reproductive uh, technology and improved diagnostic capability. But at the end of the day, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. What are the risk factors? Well, really four risk factors have been defined. African-American descent, an older maternal age, multi-fetal births, and hypertensive disorders during pregnancy. These are the four things that have really, um, and, and again, that have really come out as being risk factors. So what is the clinical course of this, this disease? And again, it's widely variable. The old teaching used to say, and it's probably not really too different than the old teaching, a third, a third, and a third. A third of them get worse, a third stay the same, which is usually bad, and a third get better. So again, it, you know, it's, it's really an all bets are off situation. Some of these women do, with medical management and good, good, um, good care, uh, really uh, get back to a fairly normal ejection fraction. Some have persistent left ventricular dysfunction, and some progress to cardiogenic shock requiring, you know, assisted technologies such as LVADs, or they also um, may require transplantation. So it, again, it's, it's a scary disease. So it, again, it's, it's a scary disease. Multiple mechanisms have been proposed in the literature. And again, it's a potpourri of things. People have implicated low selenium. They've speculated about viral infections. They've, you know, the usual, round up the usual suspects, stress-activated cytokines, inflammation, although that, there's less evidence for that autoimmune and alloimmune interactions, which I'm going to actually talk about a little bit later, and vascular disease associated with the hormonal changes of pregnancy. And then you get into these really speculative explanations, unbalanced oxidative stress of pregnancy leading to angiogenic imbalance and impaired cardiomyocytes, that, you know, those kinds of explanations that are a little um, that are a little short on details. The other thing that you should know is there is an association with peripartum cardiomyopathy and preeclampsia. And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later as well. So clinical recognition, and again, um, it's often delayed. As when you're seeing a young, healthy woman going through a pregnancy, 
it's not the first thing that you think of when you have somebody who, who says, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm short of breath. There is a condition called dyspnea of pregnancy, which is thought to be hormonal. Um, there is, you know, there's also the issue of when you have a big baby in a little person, there is some impairment of your respiratory function. Uh, but one of the things that happens is these women um, don't get diagnosed in a prompt matter because y there are sort of these other explanations. Well, you're just tired, you're pregnant, what do you expect? Um, and, and they look at it as, as part of sort of some of the, uh, you know, the normal pregnancy. So it can get missed. The typical, it's, it, these, for these women, the presentation of congestive heart failure is fairly typical. There can be EKG changes. There can be pulmonary congestion on exam and on radiographic studies. If they do get echoed, you, you can start seeing left ventricular systolic function. And for this definition, it, an EF of less than 45% is required. You can see elevated biomarkers, so BNPs and troponinemias. Um, and the prognosis is, um, it, it, carries, it's a, it carries sort of a not so great prognosis. Uh, there's a mortality of 19% in the general population and in the African cohorts up to 30%. And whether it's a slightly different disease um, in that group of people or whether it's a function of their, the medical care um, is uh, less good, um, it's hard to say there as well. So in the recently published IPAC study, which is Investigations of Pregnancy-Induced Cardiomyopathy, for, and they looked at 100 patients, the one-year mortality was 4%. By year one, 13% of women had experienced life-threatening events, and that would include um, either death, requirement for transplant, LVAD, or persistently low ejection fraction and heart failure. The event-free survival was 93%. And the event-free survival was much worse in the women that had the very low quartile ejection fractions. Um, I had a, a patient that I've taken care of since 2008. At the time of diagnosis, her ejection fraction was 11%. She's now sort of, um, she, she gets by, but she's never fully recovered. Now, seven years later, we're managing her, and her ejection fraction is about 40 to 45% but she's had arrhythmias, other complications, and is still on lots of medication to try and maintain that recovery. Spontaneous recovery occurs in about 33 to 72% of cases, but even women who are recovered, and in fact, we don't really even anymore so much think about these people who improve their ejection fractions so much as a recovery, because I think it's probably, um, a misnomer and it leads people to think everything's fine is more of a remission, okay? So we can have these people that are very sick with cardiomyopathy, you take care of them with all your, um, the tools in your armamentarium and they have a remission and they can improve their functional status, but underneath it they probably still have a cardiomyopathy. And the reason that that semantic is important is because if we say that they've recovered, they often go out to the GPs or see other doctors and they'll say, the notes say you're recovered. Why do you need all this medicine? Let's stop it. And that's a little bit of a sporting thing. And we've all seen patients like this come back very sick again when someone has just sort of spontaneously stopped all of their um, evidence-based medication. So recurrence can occur and subsequent pregnancies are inadvisable. Whenever a woman is diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy, we strongly, strongly caution them, please do not fall pregnant again. Now that's a pretty tough thing to tell a young woman. And, and we have a girl um, right now in the ICU who um, it was a very young girl, very nice girl. She had a pregnancy, her ejection fraction, she was very sick, her ejection fraction improved to about 30%. And uh, unfortunately, she had an unplanned uh, second pregnancy, which she carried to term. And she's now upstairs on um, a balloon pump with an ejection fraction of about 11%. And, you know, her young family, you know, she's got two young children now, less than three years old, a baby and this young child. She's got a young husband. I mean, you, you can imagine the um, stress of the situation. 
in what we call recovered women, and again, I don't love that term, but it's in the literature, 21% of women will reduce their ejection fraction by another 20% with a, with a subsequent pregnancy, and in unrecovered women, 44% will suffer further reductions in their ejection fraction. Um, the mortality in this unrecovered group is, is significantly higher. Overall, a one-third of women will suffer further deterioration with another pregnancy. And so um, I really try and counsel women in the strongest possible terms, and I plead with them and say it's really important to be around for the baby that you have. And I, you know, I try to appeal to them on all sorts of, but people are very reluctant to be told that they can't have more children. It's, it's, it's something, it's part of our biologic thing. Now, I'm going to start, and I'm just going to sort of take a little U-turn, because that's about what we know about peripartum cardiomyopathy. And what I want to do is I want to sort of tantalize you just a little bit with, some, with the fact that pregnancy, we don't, even though we're pretty sophisticated in 2016, we really don't know that much about it, frankly. And I got very interested in alloimmunity or the immune responses that were involved with pregnancy because I had a son, I, uh, my second son was born in 1994, I'm sorry, 1998, and that's Daniel. And he had hemolytic disease, the newborn, from something called anti-cal antibody. Now, my, my husband has an antigen on his red cells. He's a hematologist, so I always say this is all his fault. But he has an antigen on his red cells called, anti -cal, called cal. And it, only about 4% of the population has this. And so it's very analogous to the anti-D, which you probably learned about in medical school. So your first pregnancy, so I'm Kel negative, my husband's Kel positive, our first son was Kel positive, and I, during that pregnancy I was exposed to his fetal cells, and I made, I had a huge, it's an extremely antigenic uh, thing, this, this, this glycoprotein on the red cell. And I made these huge amount of antibodies. I didn't know it. Who would know? And then when I had a second pregnancy, uh, we did fortunately discover that I had this because um, then the antibodies that I made then attacked the second pregnancy because, of course, the second baby also inherited the anti cal from his dad. Now, this is a really interesting antibody because what it does is it cu cuts off the fetal cell erythropoiesis at the progenitor level. So the granulocytes are okay, the platelets are okay, but these babies stop making red cells. It's the weirdest thing. We don't know why they do it, we don't understand it, but um, so Daniel was born in 1998. He was called the miracle baby when we were living in Australia. We had to treat him with intrauterine cord transfusions. And remember, the cord is really little when they're like 20 weeks old. His hemoglobin was three. He was in high output heart failure. His liver filled up his whole abdomen on the ultrasound. So it was a pretty hairy deal. Um, this is Daniel, at, born at 34 weeks. He was about four pounds. We decided at um, this age the risk of transfusion because every time you transfuse the cord, you can clot it off. So we decided that the, the, um, we delivered him early because of the attendant risks. This is Daniel now. He's a Shakespearean acting student in New York, so he's obviously done very well. But I got very interested in all this, allo this, auto this immune response that women have to pregnancy. And I think there's something really interesting here. And I'm just going to give you a little primer this morning about pregnancy and immunity because it's super interesting. And I think you'll be seeing more on this in the next few years. So humans are eutheria. And that means that we're placental animals. And this has allowed an internal organ, which is the uterus, to protect and nourish fertilized eggs, fertilized eggs and allow for the birth of a highly developed offspring. Now, the real question is, why don't we reject our babies the way that we would any other foreign tissue? And I'm a transplant doctor, so this is also interesting for me in that respect. So our fetuses are semi-allogeneic, meaning half like mom, half like dad. Immune tolerance is mediated by, by the placenta, which is made up of two layers of baby, so fetal trophoblast cells, and one layer 
of mom, which is the maternal decidua. And I, it, graphically, that sort of looks like this. Uh, this part, the decidua, is, is mom, and here are the spiral arteries, and then these two layers are baby, and this is the part that leads uh, to the, um, this is the umbilical uh, vein and arteries. So this is a very interesting structure. Again, we don't know that much about it. So let me just give you a little bit of um, immunology about pregnancy because it's super interesting. Trophoblast, ce trophoblast cells form the interface between the fetus and the mom. They escape allo recognition, okay? So recognition of this baby as a foreign object because they lack HLA class one and class two molecules, which are how, which is the basis for recognizing self versus non-self. Any alloimmune response must be carefully mediated to keep a pregnancy in homostasis. It's very important stuff. The trophoblast plays a permissive role in allowing a bi-directional exchange of traffic at the maternal fetal interface. And remember, the baby is immune naive, but the mother is immune mature, okay? So there, there are going to be different responses to these shared cells. So the exchange of cells gives rise to maternal microchimerism in the fetal circulation. So the baby gets the mother's cells circulating, and the, fetus, and the mother has fetal microchimerism. We have women who've had babies have fetal cells circulating. And this is a really um, cool area. Both types of microchimerism last well beyond the pregnancy itself. So ladies, your children are still with you. Fetal microchimerism in the mother may begin at seven weeks of gestation and may re remain in the circulation up to 27 years postpartum. And interestingly, there is some emerging data suggesting that it's this fetal microchimerism, which may partially explain why women actually live longer, because you get this bolus of stem cells um, at, when you have babies. Maternal microchimerism, in fact, may be lifelong owing to the immature state of the fetal immune system. So your, your, your children may always have their mother's cells with them. Okay, maternal immune cells may become sensitized to these inherited paternal antigens, okay? So once, once you have a baby, it's half like you, half like dad, the fetal cells are circulating in the maternal uh, circulation, and that means that you can make an, an alloimmune response to these cells that are half different than you, and those are called inherited paternal antigens. And this can be reflected in the formation of anti-HLA antibodies in a significant proportion of women that have babies. We run into the, all this all the time in transplant, where we have women who've had children, and they have very high levels of, of panels of reactive antibodies because of this exposure to these inherited paternal antigens. So these fetal-derived chimeric cells, which are circulating in mom, remember we can find them at least up to 27 years, they can induce these alloantibodies. Autopsy studies of pregnant women have located these, these uh, chimeric cells in the, um, these are women who've unfortunately died when they were pregnant in lungs, spleens, livers, kidneys, and hearts to a greater extent than non-pregnant females. To make the story even more complex, women often harbor microchimeric cells from their own mother, so the grandmother of the baby, your own mother, for your lifetime. So those are called non-inherited maternal antigens. So it's a complicated immunologic milieu. So there is a bi-directional cell movement of cells during a normal pregnancy. This is associated with the development of the fetal immune system. So they need those cells to start priming the, the, the naive fetus. There, ha there is the development of tolerance mechanisms, which are associated with maintaining a healthy pregnancy. 
There's also the idea that fetal cells have some role in tissue repair or in, cre or in autoimmune disease and immune surveillance. Now, if tolerance is not established towards a pregnancy, this can result in fetal wastage during the pregnancy via a maternal immunal, immunologic response directed towards the fetus, which is semi-allogeneic. So what I'm trying to say here is that there's a delicate balance between immunologic priming and immunologic tolerance in a normal pregnancy. Mothers and babies are different, clearly. Chimeric cells acquired from the mother during the fetal life occurs again when the fetus is immune naive and in the fetal cells has an, Im an immature immune system. And so there's not going to be much of an immunologic response. On the other hand, chimeric cells that enter the maternal circulation are encountered by a fully mature maternal immune system. So this is, I'm going to take one more little turn here, and I, sorry if this is, I hope everybody's had their Starbucks, because this immunology stuff is a little out there. The adaptive immune system is what we refer to when we talk, this is evolved, so that we recognize and remember a unique diversity of antigens. The cells of the adaptive immune system are educated and instructed as, as our immune system develops, not to mount a harmful response towards antigens that are encoded by our own genome. So in other words, th this is how we don't destroy ourselves. In humans, this is all mediated by the major histocompatibility um, complex, and this is called the HLA complex. So, and there are two types, and I'll get into that in a minute. The HLA or MHC complex consists of genes that encode cell surface glycoproteins, that are required for antigen presentation to, to E cells and antigen presentation of other um, pathogenic like viruses and bacteria and things like that. Each individual has a specific MHC and HLA protein and it functions just like an immunologic fingerprint. This will help your immune cells distinguish its own cells from foreign cells. Transplant rejection, and I'm jumping into that because it's related to this. Remember, you know, a transplant, we match these organs, but they're not 100% like the, the donor and recipients and transplant are not haploidentical, unless you have an identical twin that gives you a kidney or something, which is fabulous. But in most cases, that's not the case, never in transplants for hearts. Transplant rejection occurs because the immune system recognizes the transplanted tissue as foreign due to an HLA mismatch, and the immune response is similar to that directed towards any other foreign particle. I will get back to pregnancy in a minute. The MHC genes encode proteins that are involved in antigen presentation to T cells and T cell receptors, and the outstanding feature of the MHC molecules is their extensive polymorphism, which is critical. So there is a huge amount of variability and there is a huge repertoire so that we can fine tune this immunologic reaction that distinguishes self versus non-self. There are some differences between MHC1 and 2. MHC1 is encoded by all nucleated cells in the body. They are encoded on, two di on several different genes, and they are structurally somewhat different than MHC2. And the MHC2, the MHC1 is involved in cell-mediated immunity, and MHC2 is involved in these antigen presentations to T cells. Now, there are several different pathways, and you don't have to remember all the details of this, but Immune responses occur mainly against MHC1 and MHC2 genes. There are a direct, an indirect, and a semi-direct pathway. I don't expect you to remember the details of all of this, but they have different time frames, which in, for in the transplant world is really interesting. T cells are critical to the strategy that is involved to suppress immune reactivity to fetal antigens that are foreign to mothers, just like occurs in the transplant literature. And um, again, remember, guys, that we didn't know anything about T cells until the HIV epidemic. We, didn't know, we knew nothing until the 1980s. So this research and our understanding 
of this work is still in its infancy. I mean, the HIV epidemic, as horrible as it was, it really elucidated all of the mechanisms by how T cells work, because of course HIV, you know, um, attacks the T cells. So the T cells or T lymphocytes play a central role in the cell mediated immunity. They can T cells can be distinguished from other lymphocytes such as B cells and natural killer cells by the presence of the T cell receptor on the cell surface. Okay, and there are different types. Again, I don't think we have to go into a lot of detail about this. There are CD4 cells, which is, refers to a glycoprotein found in the T helper cells, monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells, and CD8 cells that are cytotoxic cells that are involved with this, um, the T cell receptor binding to MHC. So all of these are implicated in this very complex process. Again, there's a direct an indirect and semi-direct pathway. And again, I'm not gonna expect you to know the details, but one of the really interesting things, if you look at these little graphs down here at the bottom, and they're small, but they're really interesting. You can see that, in, and this is in the kidney transplant literature, that the direct pathways and the semi-direct pathways are very important early in transplant. And this is where we see the highest levels in early transplant uh, when we, we're talking about rejection, and we have to immunosuppress people the most heavily right after they've had a transplant of foreign tissue. However, one of the things I tell patients all the time when I try and explain to them why um, a transplant doesn't last as long as a regular or organ is that we can fool Mother Nature some of the time, but we can't fool her all the time. And this is, really um, this is really reflected in this indirect pathway, which you can see gets upregulated and probably is more important over time. And it's probably the reason that you know, we get coronary vasculopathy in a transplanted organ. It's the reason we get coronary, uh, we get CAN or nephropathy in a renal transplant. So it's the reason it doesn't last as long as a normal organ would because of this low level alloimmune response. Okay, we are gonna get back to pregnancy. Remember, pregnancy is unique. The fetus harbors antigens that the immune maternal immune system has not been exposed to. A key strategy that's evolved to mediate this maternal fetal tolerance is this T regulatory cell. And it specifically suppresses immune reactivity to fetal antigens that are foreign to the mother. And these, these cells are the cornerstone of immunologic tolerance during pregnancy. And in, in a normal pregnancy, there's a specific regulation towards NEMA on the fetal side, so non-inherited maternal antigens, the mom stuff that the baby sees, and towards the inherited paternal antigen, the stuff from the baby that is foreign to mom that the mom sees. So what is the evidence that peripartum cardiomyopathy involves alloimmune and autoimmune dysregulation? Well, it's actually increasing, and we're in the early days of looking at this. And findings that autoantibodies against the adenosine nucleotide translocator ANT, and remember ANT is like the last step in creating ATP in your mitochondria, um, against the branch chain alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase and against cardiac myosin were found to be significantly higher in patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy compared to pregnant controls. Recent reports also suggest that there's significantly higher beta-1 adrenal receptor and myosin or in other adrenal receptors autoantibodies in peripartum cardiomyopathy patients compared to controls, and that the titers of these antibodies are actually correlated to the severity of cardiac dysfunction and negatively correlated with ejection fraction. So, and, and I'm going to just say one other thing, because I mentioned to you earlier in a previous slide that it appears that preeclampsia has a relationship. Now, preeclampsia is thought to be a problem directed at those spiral arteries connecting mom and baby, some sort of dysregulation there. Um, I mean, there are a lot of theories about that as well. I won't go into that, but there is a relationship between these two illnesses. Again, preeclampsia is responsible to, for 15 to 20 percent of maternal mortality, so it's contributing to that excess mortality that I showed you in the first, in the second slide. 
there's an 11 fold increase in hypertensive moms and it, the preeclampsia, the incidence is doubled in African American women compared to Caucasians. Recent studies um, show increasingly that uh, preeclampsia is associated with poor trophoblastic invasion as a result of altered production of immune regulatory cytokines and angiogenic factors. So this is something we need to really understand a lot better. And in this disease, they've able, been able to find very high levels of anti-angiotensin antibodies against, um, and they are present in 70 to 95% of preeclamping patients and there is a very strong correlation with disease severity. So I'm just sort of throwing that out there to give you a little, you know, pregnancy immunology 101, because I think this is going to be where the money is going to be at in this peripartum cardiomyopathy and probably even in preeclampsia. Um, maternal mortality rates are increasing. We need a lot more attention to this er area. We need to understand something that's so basic to how we survive as a human race. We need more basic studies. We need good registries for both peripartum cardiomyopathy and preeclampsia, including biobanking um, and you know serum from moms, looking at antibodies, DNA from babies. Remember, a lot of times, and we don't know the role of having lots of different fathers, which would also expose you to different inherited paternal antigens. That's something registry data could probably shed some light on. And we certainly need a more concerted societal effort if we're going to prevent maternal and fetal mortality. So I'm just going to close this by saying mother's lives matter. So thank you very much.